and welcome, my name is Dr. K. In today's video, we will examine five gait deviations specific to the ankle and foot complex. Specifically, we will look at the initial contact of the gait cycle. I hope you enjoy it and learn a lot from it. Alrighty, let's get into it. First gait deviation that we will examine is foot slap. It's pretty common to see foot slap in the clinic, so let's take a look at it. Here, we observe rapid ankle plantar flexion after heel contact. The name foot slap comes from the characteristic noise made by poorly controlled eccentric plantar flexion. The impairment here is mild weakness of ankle dorsiflexors. It's typically caused by common peroneal nerve palsy, distal peripheral neuropathy, or L4 L5 nerve root injury. The pathomechanics in this case is ankle dorsiflexors have sufficient strength to dorsiflex the ankle during the swing phase of the gait, but not enough strength to control ankle plantar flexion after heel contact. The next gait deviation that we will observe is foot flat. Here, instead of the heel making contact with the ground, we observe the full plantar surface of the foot contacting the ground. The impairment here is marked weakness of ankle dorsiflexors once again. It's typically caused by common peroneal nerve palsy, distal peripheral neuropathy, or L4 L5 nerve root injury. The pathomechanics in this case is similar to the pathomechanics of foot slap. Ankle dorsiflexors have sufficient strength to partially dorsiflex the ankle during swing, but not enough strength to control ankle plantar flexion after the heel contact. The next gait deviation that we will observe is forefoot contacting the ground. When the forefoot contacts the ground, the heel will follow. In this case, the impairment is severe weakness of ankle dorsiflexors. It's caused by common peroneal nerve palsy, distal peripheral neuropathy, or L4, L5, nerve root injury. The pathomechanics in this case is no active dorsiflexion is possible during swing. Normal dorsiflexion occurs during stance as long as the ankle has full range of motion. The compensations that are typically observed at this deviation is the requirement of excessive hip or knee flexion to avoid catching the toes on the ground. So the next gait deviation that we will observe is once again forefoot establishing contact with the ground instead of the heel. The heel will follow, but the heel in this case follows by the posterior displacement of the tibia. Let's take a look. The impairment here is typically a plantar flexion contracture or possibly a spasticity of ankle plantar flexors, secondary to upper motor neuron lesion, cerebral palsy, or a cerebrovascular accident. Here, the pathomechanics is knee hyperextension occurs during stance phase, owing to inability of tibia to move over the foot. The typical compensations is that during the terminal stance, we observe hip flexion and excessive forward trunk lean to shift the weight over the body. And our last gait deviation for ankle and foot complex would be the forefoot establishing contact with the ground. But in this case, the heel will never come in contact with the ground. Let's take a look. Typical impairments here can be secondary to pain, typical calcaneal fracture or plantar fasciitis. Or it can also be secondary to plantar flexion contraction or spasticity of ankle plantar flexors. Once again, secondary to upper motor neuron lesion, cerebral palsy or cerebrovascular accident. The pathomechanics in this case is in the case of pain, it serves as a purposeful strategy to avoid weight bearing on the heel. And compensation seen is to maintain the weight over the foot, the knee, and the hip are kept in flexion through stance phase, leading to a crouch gait, requiring short steps. 